Are you a dark dreamer? It is said that to best enjoy the light, you must first explore the heart and soul of the darkness. We are the artists who create in the shadows, whose dreams are designed to become your reality. I'm Stanley Weotter. Welcome to my world of the dark fantastic. Welcome to the world of dark dreamers. Are you a dark dreamer? Clive Barker most definitely is. Born in Liverpool, England in 1952, Clive Barker is acclaimed internationally as a true Renaissance man of horror and fantasy or to use the term Barker himself prefers, the fantastique. After first bursting upon the scene in the mid 80s with the collections of short stories entitled Clive Barker's Books of Blood, Barker then moved into the realm of epic horror and dark fantasy with such early bestsellers as The Damnation Game and Weave World. His distinctive writings have enjoyed the rare success of achieving popular acceptance, as well as a worldwide cult following. But the printed page has never been enough to express all the dark dreams of Clive Barker. In 1987, he wrote and directed the unforgettable Hellraiser, which might best be described as a supernatural erotic thriller. Like so many concepts of Barker's, which cannot be fully contained in a single film, Hellraiser has spawned an ongoing series of sequels. Clive also wrote and directed Nightbreed in 1990 and Lord of Illusions in 1995, both based on his own novellas. Clive recently invited us to his home in Beverly Hills, California, taking a brief respite from a work schedule that would be daunting for three individuals. For besides being a best-selling author, the man is also an accomplished artist the day after his 48th birthday, we sat down in his studio to discuss what drives a man to work so hard to illuminate the darkness. Clive, if we were to get a business card from you, uh, besides the obvious name of Clive Barker, what do you think it would say for occupation? Uh, imaginer. Professional imaginer, I think, is what I would like on a, if I had to have a business card. Um, I've done so many different kinds of things, but the common thread has always been the imagination. So whether it's been working in theater or painting, uh, film obviously, novels, uh, poetry even, it's, it's the imaginative element which, uh, which I hope distinguishes the Clive Barker work. Um, so yeah, imagine I would go on the card. Well, um, I feel as though I've been given um, a task, if you will, by God, to create um, the images that I see in my mind's eye, that I see in my dreams, uh, in the most concrete and the most elegant fashion that I possibly can. Very often, the challenge is to see which medium those images belong in. That's the first question, you know? Is this a movie? Is this a book? Is it a comic is book? It a, what is it? Yes, exactly. Having figured that out, then uh, the challenge becomes, well, how urgent is it for me to speak this? Um, you know, I'm usually backed up four or five projects. <laughs> Where does this fit? Sometimes something comes along so urgently, a painting particularly, that you just have to drop everything and just go do it. A book, you know, I'm finishing up on a book right now. It's taken 14 months, which is middle range book for me, you know? I mean, I've had obviously written much shorter books, but I've written longer things too. And, um, you have to plan that. You have to, it's a long distance approach to a book that, that's gonna take 14 months of your life. Same with a movie. I mean, a movie perhaps 
of all the media we're talking about here, a movie is the thing which consumes you utterly. There is nothing else that you can do when you're making a movie, which is one of the reasons why I make so few of them, and one of the reasons why I'm looking very seriously at whether I will make any more as a director. Um, I was 48 yesterday. I think it's, it's a young man's game to get up early in the morning and go direct pictures. I want to produce a lot. I have five pictures I'm supposed to be producing or executive producing next year, which is a hefty uh, load. And even though two of those are CGI pictures and therefore have long development processes, um, nevertheless, I'm very intimately tied into their life. And so even even though, though there are a lot of producers in this town who sort of have their name on the movies and really don't have anything to do with them, I'm not one of those guys. I like to be involved. I like to, uh, I like to have a hands-on um, connection with the pictures. I don't have a career, I think. I, the, weird, the word career doesn't really connect to me, I don't know. A career implies some grand ambition. Um, career actually implies fiscal ambition more than anything else, I think, which has never been a major part of my planning. I don't think of myself as having a career. I think of myself as having a life in the imagination, living in the imagination. Career is also finite. People say, well, I put in my 30 years or my 10 years, I yeah. made my money, and I retired That's from That's exactly career. right. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not anticipating death will stop me. I fully anticipate continuing to make movies after death. I'm joking. No, no, no. I, I, <laughs> I'm obsessed with the process of, of, of making stories and making images. It's just everything in my... Uh, body and mind uh, is is conspiring to to work that way. It's Faulkner's life that's believed, or Hemingway's life that's believed, rather than like the guy like you know. Let's take an example of somebody we both know, Stephen King, who gets up on a Monday morning and writes and and works and produces two books a year and has been doing so for 25 years very successfully. Mm -hmm are presumably not cradling a, uh, a whiskey at 10 in the morning or indeed a shotgun. There's nothing that gets between me and the art except sex. Which and is that is not, and that, that is not a bad habit. That no, is a good habit. No, I also an art. It, that, well, yeah, the sex it can also, be, it, it can, can be, be. It, it can, can be. If, if done well. You know, caught on a Monday morning, it may just be a craft. Clive, when I was a child, uh, I decided very early on to be a writer. And unfortunately, my parents were not that supportive. They really thought that that was a road to ruin to go into the arts. And uh, actually, for me, it spurred me on to try to be a better writer, a better artist, by the fact that I really had very little parental support. I was wondering, when you realized at that young age that you want to go into the arts, I was wondering what your parents' reaction was to that decision. They were certainly saying, Clive, what were you, were you doing with your life? But I don't think I ever got as close to defining it that I could ever have said, oh, well, it's science fiction, it's horror, or whatever. Um, they just didn't like the idea of me, my being in the arts. It seemed to them um, disastrous. Um, Disastrous fiscally, disastrously, if, disastrous if I wanted to raise a family. Uh, uh, you know, there were, I think, I think people who don't work in the arts have a very uh, jaundiced vision of what we actually do and how we go about it. I think uh, uh, too often it's the legend that's believed. There's a tendency both to over-romanticize the profession of the arts, to make it sound as though it's a lap of luxury on the one hand, and also to make it sound um, 
a lot more demoniacal than it actually is. For a lot, a lot of the time, as you know, it's just sitting down and working through technical problems of how to express something that's in your mind's eye that you wish to tell or show to somebody else, somebody you will probably never meet. At the age of 31, I didn't have a bean in my pocket. Uh, you, you know, it, it's, um, it's perfectly fine for people to say. I think it's right that people say, well, why shouldn't I have a crack at it? Yeah. Um, good God, when I read the books or see the movies that are on the screen, I think more people should be having a crack at it. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I see an awful lot of movies which seem very derivative of other movies. I see a lot of books which seem like warmed over versions of other people's books. Um, no, I say more power to the person who says, I want to have a go at it. They've got to be prepared for disappointment and, you know, all the things we were talking about before. But, you know, if you take those things on board and you're prepared for that, well, man, go for it. For me, the pleasure of creating a Thief and now Aberat has been the pleasure of doing something which I, Clive Barker, would enjoy. And I think, in a way, that's what you've always got to do. You've got to make work which you you believe that if you were to come and find it in a bookstore, you, you would pick up, you would take pleasure in. I like to, to, um, I like my human life, uh, my domestic life, my, uh, ordinariness. I, I, I don't like public life very much. I like a kind of invisibility that comes with being able to be an author and quietly go to your, your uh, uh, writing room and write. Clive, is it true you actually do all your writing in longhand? Yeah. One would think that if you used a word processor, you could quadruple your output. You know, it's not broken, why fix it? Um, it's not about quantity anyway, is it? No. It's about quality. And I've been writing, I think, quite serviceable prose longhand for 20 books, 21 books now. Um, I have noticed that when people get onto word processors, sometimes the quality goes down. Uh, it's a little too easy. The writing becomes facile. Uh, you can just pop in there and change this or add that and move things around. Handwriting things is laborious. You get it right or you don't. Um, I like that discipline. You know, we had the e-channel calling up and saying we'd like to come and, you know, do a program about your, your, house. your house. Well, guys, no. You know, that's my house. And I live in it and it's private. And the part of me that... I want to show is actually the most important part of me, the part which dreams with his eyes open. The rest belongs to me and to my loved ones. And I'm not being secretive or, or coy or, or, coy or, or anything. anything. I just don't feel it's, it's, it's who I am. I don't feel that, I feel as though the things that I do, I do on the page, I do on the canvas, I do quietly with the door closed. And uh, if there is any value in our doing something like this together, it would be in part so that I can say um, that it's okay to be uh, a quiet, offbeat, weird kid with an offbeat imagination. Um, because if you follow the lead that that imagination gives you, um, you may one day find something that will enchant people. But the thing that enchants people isn't Clive Barker. It's a growth out of Clive Barker. Do you, do you see what I mean? I, do. I think writers should retain some measure of dignity. And I don't think... Uh, turning out the contents of your psyche as though it were an attic uh, that uh, 
that the world had uh, the right to um, is appropriate. In fact, one of the things that I think a writer should be doing is preserving the secrets of his or her heart and soul because you never know where hidden deep inside that attic space is something which one day will turn into a world. And why the hell show it before it's become a world? My work is best made when I am centered, when I'm not thinking about myself, when I'm not thinking about, you know, Barker's ego or Barker's opinion or how Barker appears in the world. Who the fuck cares how Barker appears in the world? And I was wondering if, in fact, if we can call them fans, if that cult following, that fandom, in any way influences the way you work. Um... Where I encounter my fans, and I don't even really like the word fans, it, it, there's something slightly condescending about the word fans. They're readers, they're my readers. Um, uh, where I encounter my readers uh, is obviously at conventions and uh, at, at signings, at uh, book signings, though recently they've become, in some cases, so large, it's become harder and harder and harder to really get a, a personal Intimate thing going, one and one yeah, um, which I regret. Um, I try and answer the letters uh, still, though they're, they come in their thousands now. Um, we have the internet, so we have ways of answering yeah, people's yeah. questions that way, though that is never going to be as intimate as this kind of conversation. I think in a way, and I've said this several times, that the most... Uh, truthful and intimate things that I can say about myself are in the books. I need to preserve a space around myself, and which is also an interior space, actually, uh, in which things can grow, images can grow, stories can grow, worlds can grow. There are no regrets, there's no time for regrets. Why regret? Um, no, absolutely no time for regret. Uh, I think the business of writing and uh, of art, if you will, is, is, is driven by some greater force in me. I'm very, very conscious of, of, of energy and how much I have of it and how I'm going to preserve it and use it for the best possible purpose. The purpose is making books, making paintings. Uh, how many more of those do I have in me? That's the question. And uh, there's so much, Stan, in my head right now that I want to express. There are so many images I want to paint, so many books I want to write, that the idea of being distracted by becoming an advertisement, advertisement for myself yeah. uh, strikes me as uh, a waste of time. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe if you caught me on a different day, it wouldn't preoccupy me as much as it does. But uh, here am I, five weeks from delivering a book, and, you know, I spent much of the day um, answering telephone calls, doing interviews, and here I am doing another interview today. And um, while I see that that's part of the job, and I, I, res I understand that in a, in, a, in a world in which people have lots of uh, calls upon their attention, you know, they can turn on the internet, they can turn on the television, they can go to a movie, uh, that, that I, as the author, am going to be the best apologist for my book. And so, therefore, I've got to kind of get out there and talk about it. Nevertheless, uh, there's a part of me that's come to realize that the book should speak for itself. And um, 
um, the painting should speak for themselves. And if they don't speak well enough, well, that's perhaps because they're not good enough. It's never what you want it to be, but you, you keep after it. It's the quest beast. It, it, it's, it's always just out of sight. It's always just around the corner. And that's what gets you up in the morning is thinking that today the sentence might be better, the painting might be closer to the dream. Um, that remains, um, that remains hugely appealing, the idea that, that, that somehow or other I can be a better artist than I am. You can only, you can only play the art world on the basis of how does this satisfy me internally? Does this answer the spiritual need that brought me to the piece of paper in the first place? Have I been a good conduit for the voices that wish to speak this time round? Yeah. Yeah. And um, hopefully you learn as you advance how to be a better conduit so that next time it's a little smoother, it's a little easier for those voices to be heard. I can't concern myself over much with what people are saying about me, good or bad. I mean, I know, for instance, authors who are glued to the internet because there are all these sites where you're being talked about. Well, my God, I went on one of those and I <laughs> looked at a whole bunch of people uh, talking about me. I got. You know, I freaked out. Freaked out. Yeah, I, 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 I felt myself blushing, yeah. and I thought, I'm not going to do this again. I can't do this. This is like listening in on a private conversation in which a bunch of people are talking in very strong, with very strong opinions about me. I don't want to have that in my head when I go and write my book. My first responsibility is to the to the thing which is, uh, that wishes to, that, that is waiting to be expressed. And uh, so I keep out of that world, I keep out of the Hollywood world except to do my job. And um, I'm frankly happiest um, sitting at my desk or, uh, you know, this is my studio in its usual form mm -hmm. with a bunch of canvases around up to my neck in paint and with the music playing loudly. I mean, that's, that's my idea of bliss. That's, that's, uh, that's the closest I'm going to get to heaven on earth. Join me here again on the wild side of the imagination where a sense of wonder and a feeling of terror can often intersect. You'll find us waiting here the dark dreamers.